since I didn't get a video out for Christmas this year, yes, I know that's so shameful, I got caught up in trying to finish off a course for four and dealing with a tree that decided to attack the back of our house. I thought I would try and make amends by looking at the nativity scene that is so popular and that we're so familiar with. These displays are in parks, churches, storefront windows, fireplaces, and we even have living nativities that are so popular today as well. Nativities are even known to appear on YouTube. It's one of the best known Christian images. Now this scene has a really long history to its development in the final form that we know today, and it contains some really interesting twists and turns. For example, the ox and the ass, so common in crush scenes, are not in the Gospels at all. Rather, they're the result of some creative biblical interpretation performed in the early church. If you're new here, my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminaries and other schools around the world for the past 20 plus years and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you find these videos useful and encouraging, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. That really helps me a lot with getting the word out and spreading these videos on YouTube. The earliest depictions of Jesus' birth are really simple compared to the later depictions and the ones that we have today. Perhaps the simplest is that it is just Jesus or Jesus and his parents. This carved image on a sarcophagus or coffin in Milan from around 350 AD just has Jesus in his manger with farm animals on either side, so you don't miss the point. The shepherds or the magi arriving to visit Jesus is another very early development. Now, the farm animals, the shepherds, or the magi all hew very closely to the biblical accounts found in Matthew and Luke. Neither Mark nor John contain narratives about Jesus' birth. Now, these early depictions contrast very sharply with depictions that we have today, where we have the magi, the shepherds, farm animals, Mary and Joseph all crowding into the stable. However, this combination of characters is the result of extra biblical accounts and some very creative biblical interpretation. So let's pull this scene apart and see how we got here. First, the inclusion of both the shepherds and the magi in the scene reflects a very common form of early biblical interpretation that's even practiced today. This is what we call harmonization. Matthew records the story of the Magi coming to worship Jesus because they stand a star in the sky in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When they arrived in Israel, they naturally went to Jerusalem to learn where this new king was born. The chief priests and the scribes informed Herod that the promised ruler would be born in Bethlehem. And this is what Herod tells the wise men. He then sends them on their way, but they are warned of his duplicity not to return and tell him where they found Jesus. We don't know how many wise men there were, their names or anything like that. All we know is that they brought gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Now Luke completely ignores the story of the Magi. Instead, he focuses on the shepherds in the field watching their sheep. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 18, an angel appears to the shepherds at night, and they are directed to go into Bethlehem and find the baby. They do as directed, they go into Bethlehem and they find the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Harmonization is when you try to bring these two accounts together to harmonize them. Technically, what you're trying to do is smush the two accounts together. The earliest example of this is a book called the Dia Tesseron by Tatian. Dia Tesseron simply means through the four. Tatian took Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and cut and pasted them together into one harmonized version of Jesus' life around 160 AD. Tatian was not the last to create a harmony of the Gospels. There are a number of them still being compiled and printed today. The strength of a harmony of the Gospels is that you get to have all the stories in the four Gospels put together into what the compiler thinks is the proper historical order. Because remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't follow the same chronology of events. 
The problem with a harmony is that it removes the unique theological contributions each of the evangelists make. In this case, Matthew focused on the powerful men, the Magi, Herod, chief priests, and even Joseph in his account of Jesus' birth. Luke, on the other hand, focused on women and the poor, Mary, Elizabeth, the shepherds, and then old prophets in the temple. Oh, I should say, this copy of the nativity scene was done by my wife a number of years ago from a kit. So if you're wondering what it is, that's where it came from. Now, while Tatian and the other harmonies of the gospel smushed the shepherds and the magi together, what's interesting is that this development would take almost a thousand years before it gets depicted into artwork. So anytime that you see both the magi and the shepherds together in a nativity scene, it's because the creator of that scene was influenced by a harmonized reading of the biblical text. Proto-Matthew, the ox and the ass. Another very important player in the story of the nativity scene is this book called the Proto-Evangelium or the Proto-Gospel of Matthew. All right, I'm jumping in as editor right now. I'm working on the video and I made a huge mistake. I am calling the pseudo-gospel of Matthew the proto-gospel. So from now on, when you hear me say the proto-gospel of Matthew, I'm really talking about the pseudo-gospel of Matthew. Oh, and just a heads up, I'm gonna have a lot of bloopers like this at the very end. So if you like bloopers, stick around to the very end of the video. Now the proto-gospel is an apocryphal text. It never made it into the New Testament. But it was one of these texts that was very popular in the early church. It was written somewhere around 160 to 200 AD. As a whole, the Proto-Gospel follows the Dia Tessera invitation by harmonizing Matthew and Luke's accounts of Jesus' birth together. But it adds some other creative touches all of his own. Now, the Proto-Gospel was a very, very popular text in the early church. And we have hundreds of handwritten early manuscripts that are still existing today. There are two very interesting elements in the Proto-Evangelium that we have dropped over the ages. The first is that the birth of Jesus took place in a cave, not in a stable. And the second is that Joseph went and fetched midwives to help Mary with the birth of Jesus. Now the Eastern Orthodox Church still preserves these stories of the midwives in their nativity scenes, with the midwives portrayed as helping Mary bathe the baby Jesus. The Proto-Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, reads as follows. And on the third day after the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the most blessed Mary went forth out of the cave and entering a stable, found and placed the child in a stall. And the ox and the ass adored him. Then it was fulfilled that which was said by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib. The very animals, therefore, the ox and the ass, having him in their midst, incessantly adored him. In the Western church, the story of the midwives and Jesus' birth in a cave was dropped, and the emphasis fell on the stable and the ox and the ass. The author of the Proto-Gospel of Matthew obviously saw a connection between Jesus being laid in a manger and these common farm animals. What would you have in a manger? Farm animals. And the reference to knowing their owner and their master is allegorically extended from Isaiah to refer to Jesus. That's how they make their entrance into this story. It's interesting that the early church speculated a great deal over how many magi there were. In the early Syriac church, they thought that there were 12 magi and they were accompanied by a small army. In the Western Church, a great deal of thought was given to the Magi as well, most likely because the extravagant nature of their gifts naturally attracted a great deal of attention and speculation. Prior to Emperor Constantine declaring the Church an official religion within the Roman Empire in 313 AD, the Church read the Magi as pagan magicians who were renouncing their practices to worship Christ. Once the church was made the official religion, the Magi were now seen as kings, princes, or royal court officials from Persia. The Magi prefigured the Roman Empire turning to embrace Christianity. 
An example of this is the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy. The Magi are depicted not only as worshiping Christ, we see them depicted on the robe of Empress Theodora who paid for this church to be built. Like the Magi, she now worships Jesus as well. During the third and fourth century, the Western church says that there were three Magi, probably because there were three gifts, and we are given three names for them, Casper, Melchior, and Balsasior. Now the three Magi represent kings or members of the royal court, and this continues down to this day. But it also allowed Renaissance artists like Botticelli to depict the Medici family, his patrons, as the three Magi. The Medici may not have been royalty, but they definitely wielded power and authority along those lines during the day of Botticelli. Allegorical speculation about the Magi was not just limited to their royal status. They were also seen to represent the three ages of life, youth, middle age, and elderly. This was then extended to also include different races, African, Middle Eastern, and European, which reflected the spread of the church. St. Francis. Now, when we come to St. Francis, we need to bring all of our characters together here. All of the traditions that we've been talking about so far are brought together in 1223 by St. Francis of Assisi. Francis set up a nativity scene in a small cave in the forest outside the town of Gratio in Italy. St. Francis didn't want this service to be seen merely as novelty or some lighthearted production, but he sought and obtained the permission from the Pope before procuring with his plans, which he received. The Christmas service in 1223 was held at this cave outside Grecio. Hymns were sung and Francis chanted the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth and preached a sermon. Now in his first nativity service, it included an empty manger, a hay-lived floor, and a live ox and ass. And he wrote, I wanted to do something that would recall the memory of the child who was born in Bethlehem, to see with bodily eyes the inconveniences of his infancy how he lay in the manger, and how the ox and the ass stood by. And just a quick editorial note here. Notice that when St. Francis creates the first nativity scene, he does it off the Pseudo-Gospel of Matthew, showing that some 1,000 years after the Pseudo-Gospel was written, it is still highly influential and being read within the church. Back to our story. Now remember, most of his parishioners would not have been literate, so using images was a great way to teach them about the Christian faith. And in particular, Francis wanted them to see how Jesus was born into poverty and encourage their devotion to Christ. Ever since that first nativity by St. Francis in 1223, nativity scenes and observances have been part of our remembering Jesus' birth at Christmas. Stay. And like St. Francis, the purpose of a nativity scene is to help us to call to mind the birth of Christ and what that means. I hope how this little dive into the history of the nativity scene has helped you to understand how complex this little depiction is. It takes elements from Matthew and Luke and combines them together, harmonizes them. It picks up the allegorical connection to Isaiah 1-3 to bring the ox and the ass into the story. And it reminds us that when God came into the world, he did not come with power and wealth, but in poverty and simplicity. As you go through this Christmas season and approach Epiphany, I will leave you with the word of peace. Ever since that year, nativity scenes and enactments have been part of the observance of Christmas. There's two very, um, it's because the creator of that scene, ah, Stay up. So what would be new? Ah. At, ever since that year, nativity scenes and enactments have been part of many churches' observance of Christmas. Ah. <laughs>